So here we have uh, just a little drawing of um, a side view of a patient and a very common location for lymph adenopathy is cervical lymph adenopathy or in the neck. Here we, has, we have one of our very own specimen uh, pots and um, this is a cut section showing actually several lymph nodes that are matted together. So they're all stuck together and we call this matted, M-A-T-T-E-D. Now in the center of this uh, fleshy lymph nodal mass, you can see that there's this very irregular pale area here. This represents necrosis and this is actually an example of a case of lymphoma. The differential diagnosis in this case, looking at it grossly, would actually be tuberculosis because as you know, you can also have necrosis or caseating necrosis in tuberculosis. So let's put this lymph node where it belongs in this patient and uh, we'll look at the approach to lymph adenopathy or the approach to enla enlarged lymph node. So please note that lymph adenopathy may be localized, meaning that it is one anatomical region or it may be generalized and we've touched on the some examples of causes earlier in um, this little discussion here. When um Categorizing limb retinopathy, I think it's probably most practical to divide it into benign causes on the one hand and malignant causes on the other. So let's start off by looking at uh, benign causes of lymph adenopathy. So again, this can be subdivided clinically into acute or subacute lymph adenitis. or chronic non-specific lymph adenitis. Now looking at the acute and subacute lymph adenitis, usually clinically the lymph nodes are more likely to be tender when you examine so it's painful on touch. It may be red, it may also be warm um, and sometimes it may even lead to abscess formation or uh, discharging sinus and there may be accompanying fever. So the causes for this uh, are mostly infectious and um, within this um, infectious group, we can have uh, viral infections, we can have bacterial infections. So under bacterial infections, we must always consider TB. TB is also sometimes categorized under chronic lymph adenitis because usually uh, the presence of the enlarged lymph node can be there for quite some time, uh, quite a few months, and sometimes may also uh, present as a discharging sinus and there may also be clinical signs of inflammation. Histologically, of course, we would see necrotizing granulometers, lymph adenitis, and sometimes even accompanying separative or acute separative inflammation. And then, of course, there is chlamydia, which gives rise to lymphogranuloma venereum. This is a sexually transmitted disease that often involves the inguinal lymph nodes. And then there is cat scratch disease, which is caused by Bartonella hensley, which, which is another type of bacteria. Of course, there can also be just the good old staphylococcal infection, and this can sometimes lead to suppurative lymph adenitis or abscess within the lymph node. Now, for chronic lymph adenitis, this is usually nonspecific, and clinically, it's usually not painful or tender. And this may be seen in, again, in viral infections. For example, in HIV, you can get generalized lymph adenitis. Uh, it can also be seen in autoimmune conditions. And can be caused by drugs and can also be seen in granulomatous non-infectious lymph adenitis such as sarcoidosis. Now um, moving on to the malignant causes of lymph adenopathy, um, now we would divide this very uh, clinically into primary malignancies versus secondary malignancies. Secondary malignancies are much more common than primary lymph uh, nodal malignancies and when you consider this, uh, always bear in mind the clinical history, especially the past history of any known malignancy. It is also important to pay attention to other symptoms because this may help to point to uh, localize the source of the malignancy. And in addition, we also want to see the location, of course, of the lymph node. For example, if it is a cervical lymph node, such as in this patient, you may want to consider uh, common primary malignancies that can go there. For example, nasopharyngeal carcinoma or papillary thyroid carcinoma.
Now moving on to primary lymphoid malignancies, and of course this would refer to lymphomas, the very first point of division is that you want to divide it into Hodgkin lymphoma versus non-Hodgkin lymphoma. So this is the most important um, classification, and non-Hodgkin lymphoma is uh, more common than Hodgkin lymphoma. So most of the time, Hodgkin lymphoma occurs in a younger age group. For example, in young adulthood, perhaps in the 20s or 30s, um, there is also a second peak uh, in a slightly older age group, uh, for example, 50s or 60s, but the majority of lymphomas uh, would affect the younger adult age group. Whereas for non-Hodgkin lymphoma, the age range can be very wide, from young all the way to elderly. Apart from that, an important distinction is that usually for Hodgkin lymphoma, it occurs in the localized region of the body, for example, in the neck lymph nodes, and when it spreads, it spreads contiguously to the next closest site. Whereas in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, uh, it can be localized to a certain region or it can be generalized at clinical presentation. Now, uh, looking uh, more specifically at non-Hodgkin lymphoma, we then further subdivide it very simply into B-cell lymphomas and T-cell lymphoma. B-cell lymphoma is much more common uh, than T-cell lymphoma. And then um, further down, we can also use, the, for example, the WHO classification system. Uh, one of the, the ways to look at it is the type of cell, so precursor cell, which can be for B-cell or T-cell lymphomas and usually occurring more in younger patients, and then the mature cell type lymphomas. Um, how else do lymphomas present in addition to lymphadenopathy? Well, they can also have some systemic symptoms, such as fever, night sweats, as well as loss of weight. So it's important to remember that these uh, symptoms, sometimes known as B symptoms, not only can be caused by lymphoma, but they can also be seen in tuberculosis. So both of these can result in systemic symptoms. Now, so from the point of view of a clinical approach, how do we actually diagnose lymphoma? The clinical picture is very important. Looking at the lymph adenopathy, you want to consider, for example, whether there's any systemic symptoms, whether there's any loss of weight, that's always considered a very significant symptom, and also the location of the lymph nodes, whether it is generalized or localized. Um, not only that, the age of the patient is important, knowing that Hodgkin lymphoma, majority of them occur in young adults, and also sometimes the precursor cell lymphomas. Also, whether the patient is immunocompromised due to whatever reason, um, these patients are usually a little bit more at risk of developing lymphoma. For example, if they, are, if they have autoimmune diseases and if, if they are on treatment, or even HIV-positive patients, uh, sometimes they are at a higher risk of developing lymphoma. Now, in terms of pathology, there are actually three tiers to the way we diagnose. The first tier is, of course, to look at the histology from a lymph node biopsy, the actual microscopic appearance of uh, the lymph node. And then we do immunohistochemistry, IHC. This is where we apply antibodies to bind to specific antigens in the malignant cells. And this helps us to subtype the lymphoma, for example, into B-cell lymphoma or T-cell lymphoma. And the next tier is molecular testing. So for this, we know that there are certain specific translocations, for example, in some lymphomas like Burkitt lymphoma. So we apply this molecular test to confirm our suspicion. And uh, together, these uh, three types of testing on tissue will help us to confirm not only the type of lymphoma, uh, but also the specific subtype um, and sometimes also provide prognostic information. So just to sum up, to recap, we looked at the different clinical presentations of lymph node disease, which can be localized or can be systemic. And then we just looked at very briefly, uh, very broadly, uh, the main differential diagnosis for lymphadenopathy, which can be benign or malignant. And under benign, it includes specific, uh, usually infectious, acute or subacute lymph adenitis, and also chronic lymph adenitis. And for malignancies, um, secondary malignancies by far exceed primary malignancies, which are lymphomas. And for lymphomas, we looked at Hodgkin versus non-Hodgkin, um, different epidemiology and clinical presentation. And then for non-Hodgkin, B-cell versus T-cell. So I hope this uh, fairly simple, broad overview of lymph nodal pathology will help you to understand uh, the various types of conditions that can affect lymph nodes. And of course, you can supplement this with additional content from your lecture notes as well as your textbooks.